So what I'm going to uh, do is talk about uh, genetics and pretty much focus on colon cancer since that's uh, what brought me to Nebraska many years ago uh, mm -hmm. to work with Dr. Lynch and uh, where we're going to talk about the Lynch syndrome as well. Um, I wanted to mention that um, I am involved in a uh, colon cancer task force and you all are welcome to join. Um, we do a couple of uh, things during the year in March we have a colon cancer awareness campaign where we try to hand out fecal and cold blood testing cards to people over 50 through a lot of local pharmacies. We have some fundraising events, a bicycle ride in June and then a um, 5k run in August where you can wear your boxer shorts. So, and that's down at the uh, Werner Park which uh, would turn out uh, to be a nice location for them. We're also doing some video work, and I just put the links on here for you if you would like to look at that sometime. And this is a nice patient story of a person diagnosed with colon cancer um, that you might want to look at as well. So if we talk about colon cancer, and my talk today I'm going to focus on that as opposed to the other GI malignancies. Um, it's a common disease and common worldwide, and it also has a significant number of deaths. When you look at the causes of colon cancer, actual hereditary causes are fairly low, fairly rare. So Lynch syndrome or hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, we think is about 3 to 5 percent of colorectal cancer cases. Uh, so sporadic cancer is still the most common, 65 percent. Um, there is this sort of category of other inherited cases where we haven't really identified a genetic syndrome, but probably there is some contribution from uh, uh, mutations in genes that uh, contribute to that. And then as I mentioned, the Lynch syndrome, FAP, the familial adenoma is polyposis, less than 1%, and then some other more rare um, syndromes. So now what I'd like to do is just to kind of review a little bit of um, DNA and genetics in general. And then I'm going to talk about how do we use genetics for predictive testing. So how do you calculate a person's risk of recurrence and therefore adjust your treatment. And then talk about genetics and therapeutic options. So how can we use genetic testing to decide on what drug to give a patient. And then I'll finish up with a little bit of the hereditary genetic side of things and anything new that we have there. So what is cancer? Well, cancer is basically unregulated cellular proliferation. So the normal feedback of growth and stoppage, stopping growth in cells is disrupted. So in medical oncology, what we try to do is um, determine those changes and then develop drugs that can stop that growth. So um, over the years, we've learned a lot about what happens between the cell signals on the surface of the cell and the DNA <coughs> transcription and translation that makes the cell divide. And uh, many, many targeted therapies now are being developed to uh, inhibit those processes. So what about, what is cancer genetics? Well, if you call right now, you can get this book for 1995. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, cancer genetics, you know, we have our chromosomes and uh, 23 sets of chromosomes that we inherit one set from each of our parents. Um, and then, of course, we have the sex chromosome. There's also mitochondrial DNA as well. And all of these uh, DNA um, items um, can become mutated and contribute to cancer. Our human genome, we have about 3 billion base pairs of DNA, okay? But only about 3% of that uh, encodes for genes. Um, and of those genes, about we have about 21,000 genes in our DNA that uh, make proteins. We used to think we had 100,000 genes, but actually we have much less than that. So only about 21,000 genes. And what about the rest of that DNA? Is that just junk? Are we hoarders? Do we just hoard DNA? Well, it turns out probably not. So probably that you know, junk DNA that we don't know what it does 
probably does do something important, and if those functions are um, inhibited or uh, mutated or changed, then that may contribute to uh, malignancy as well as other diseases. So that um, part of the research is just getting started. Mm -hmm. So we have two different types of mutations. We have somatic mutations, and then we have inherited mutations. So somatic mutations are ones that occur after we're born, that we develop over our life lifetimes, either from carcinogens or by chance or random events. Um, so those mutations, as I mentioned, will promote tumor growth and make the cancer spread and metastasize. So what do we do about that? Well, we're developing targeted treatments, which we're calling now personalized treatments. So we're going to identify a patient's tumor molecular um, pattern and then pick drugs that will work for those different uh, molecular changes. That's uh, personalized cancer treatment. So we want to match the tumor with the best treatment, which results in the best quality of life and hopefully cure and long-term survival. Some of those agents that we'll be talking about later today are some of the vascular inhibitors like Avastin, um, antibody drugs, um, an area of a lot of work right now is an antibody and drug conjugate. So you're developing the antibody to a protein that's expressed in a cancer cell, and then that is linked to a drug that actually kills the cell or works on DNA uh, or is somehow toxic to the cell. Uh, and so that targets the cancer cell and kills it, but does not target normal cells so you don't have so much side effects. Tyrosine kinase inhibitor is another category. Um, in the Mendelian genetics, those are the ones that are inherited. So as I mentioned, the Lynch syndrome or the uh, HMPCC, the MSH1 and MLH2 genes, um, in breast cancer, um, the BRC1 and 2 genes, and so forth. So those are actually inherited, so we have those from birth. Uh, now, what's happening there? Well, there's something called next generation sequencing, well, where we can now have our entire DNA <coughs> sequenced um, rapidly and fairly inexpensively. So right now, it's about $10,000 or so, $5,000 to $10,000 to sequence your whole DNA. But then you would, uh, you would know what mutations you have and potentially what diseases a person is at risk of. So it may be at some point in the not so distant future, we're doing sequencing on our patient's complete DNA and finding out exactly what molecular changes they have and then trying to figure out, well, what do, what do we do about that, if any. <coughs> now let's uh, switch and talk a little bit about how does this work in colon cancer. Well, um, cancer occurs with multiple genetic changes and over Time. And so this is Bert Vogelstein, and in uh, the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, he hypothesized the system of malignancy going from benign uh, mucosa to cancer through changes in molecular uh, mutations. And so this is still true today. And on the top is the um, mutations that occur, and then on the bottom is the histologic changes that we can see under the microscope. So if we can somehow intervene in this before we get to cancer or before we get to metastasis, then uh, theoretically that patient would have a better survival. Um, so now, how do we predict prognosis using genetics? Well, um, traditionally, we would look at the histology of a tumor. And this is the TNM staging. So you would look at the tumor size, how it evades into the bowel wall, whether it's spread to lymph nodes, whether it's spread to other organs like the liver or the lungs or something. Um, and then use those factors to try to tell who's at higher risk of recurrence and therefore who needs adjuvant therapy or who needs certain uh, drugs. And um, there is something called the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines that we try to follow to help determine which stages of cancer need additional treatment and which don't. Well, can we do that better? Well, yes, of course we can do it better, right? So that's why we're here today. Um, so we're going to look at a prognostic genetic test. 
So how do we find out from a molecular standpoint now, not just a histologic standpoint, whose cancer is going to come back? Well, there's something called the Oncotype DX, and I don't know if you've heard of that or not, but it's used a lot in breast cancer, but there's also a test available for colon cancer. So what does that do? Well, um, what they've done there is they've taken a set of genes, and in this publication they looked at 761 genes that potentially could be used to develop a predictive model of who's at increased risk of recurrence. So they looked at those genes and they uh, correlated those with um, outcome in colon cancer, and they came down to a set of about 13 genes that would predict who has a high risk and who has a low risk. And in this particular situation, this is for patients with stage two colon cancer. So that means they have a tumor, but the lymph glands are negative. It hasn't spread to any other organs. And we don't really know what to do with stage two colon cancer patients. There has not been any studies that have proven adjuvant therapy, adjuvant chemotherapy, helps them live longer. But we know that some stage two colon cancer patients have their disease come back and some will die from it. So we'd like to figure out who those patients are. So in this test, they developed something called the recurrence score, which is down here on the bottom. And then they correlate that with the risk of recurrence, and in this case, it's at three years. So the recurrence score comes from those 13 genes, if they're mutated or not, and they have an algorithm and come up with a number. And that number can go from zero to up to actually to 100. So you can see that the lower the recurrence score, the less risk of recurrence. The higher the recurrence score, the recurrence risk is much greater. So theoretically, the patients on this end of the curve should probably have some additional therapy, maybe some adjuvant chemotherapy. Whereas these patients have a lower risk, they're not really going to benefit from any additional chemotherapy. So they've divided these categories into like three areas, low, intermediate, and high risk. And so we might say, well, the high risk people should probably have additional therapy. Um, and then they went and looked, tried to um, look at that in some other situations with stage two and three patients, and then combine it with chemotherapy. Um, and what they found is that, this is a little complicated slide, but you can see again, here is the recurrence score, and here is the risk of recurrence, and this time it's at five years. So patients with a low recurrence score um, have a low risk of recurrence. We probably maybe could skip the adjuvant therapy there, or give them something that's not too um, costly. Whereas these patients probably should have um, additional treatment. And then if you add in a drug called oxaloplatin to the 5-FU chemotherapy, those <coughs> patients actually do better. So these, these are the curves with the oxaloplatin patients. So certainly patients with a high recurrence score um, and that have a higher stage, like a stage 3, which are these two curves, probably should have adjuvant therapy, and it looks like oxaloplatin will also help them more than just 5-FU so this, this is just an example of what we can do now and where the future is going. I'm not going to get into detail too much on the treatment side of things, because you'll have a more discussion of that later in the day. So this is promising. We can be a little more objective in terms of genetic changes and who's really at risk of recurrence, and then hopefully um, alter our approach to treatment with that. And then this is a, a diagram that Genomic Health, who has the Oncotype test, makes to help you maybe decide who should be treated and who, who should. Now, so that's one way to look at it. How about another way? Well, this is another way of colon cancer, um, using uh, something called mismatch repair, also referred to as microsatellite micro instability. So we know that in um, Lynch syndrome, um, the genetic changes there result in this thing called mismatch repair. Well, maybe if we use that, can we help determine prognosis and treat? Well, we might be able to do that. So mismatch repair is a situation where we have mutations in genes that normally correct errors in DNA. Well, when those genes aren't working, you get too much DNA. So in a cancer cell, we have all the segments of extra DNA um, rather than the normal amount. And what happens with that is that can eventually result in a mutation and cancer. 
Well, we can detect this in the lab. So there's a way to determine if a patient's DNA has microsatellites in it uh, from the tumor. So, um, so this mismatch repair can occur as I mentioned for mutations. There's also something called hypermethylation, which we're looking at now. So if you have a normal gene, but that gene becomes methylated, which then inactivates it. So if that gene is inactivated not by a mutation, but by um, uh, a process in the cell through methylation, then you also can see mismatch repair. Um, and that's about 15% of colorectal cancers you can see that in. So not a lot, but some. But what turns out is that patients who have mismatch repair actually have a better prognosis than patients who don't. So maybe they don't really need to have additional chemotherapy if you have a mismatch repair. Um, and as it turns out, you might be resistant to some drugs. So if patients have mismatch repair, they appear to be resistant to 5 which is like the main drug in colon cancer and chemotherapy. Um, so that might be helpful to know. However, if we add oxaloplatin to that, then maybe they, they get their benefit back. So again, another thing to, on a molecular basis, try to help determine what you're going to do for your patient. Um, and again, we need to do more work there. But it's another example of how we can be more personalized in trying to figure out who gets uh, additional treatment and who doesn't. So what we want to do is identify optimal treatment strategies based on these genetic profiles in addition to the histologic stage that we uh, have so commonly used. Um, now, what about, um, actually, uh, yeah, I'm sure I did there, but. so let's talk about a mutation in KRAS, so I don't know if you heard about that, but we can use KRAS now for therapeutic um, prediction. So here's an example of the cell where you have the cell uh, membrane here, and then, as I mentioned, all these different um, changes in the cytoplasm that go to the DNA and it, uh, eventually cause cell growth. So there's many, many different pathways here that um, end up having mutations. And in this case, it's the RAS gene. So in colon cancer, the RAS gene it can be mutated. And when that happens, this impulse to make the cell divide is just turned on. It just keeps going. So that's what uh, contributes to the malignancy. And we know that RAS mutations are found in about 50% of sporadic colon cancers. Um, and um, we know that if um, there's a mutation in the RAS gene, some of the drugs we have in colon cancer won't work. So we would not want to use those in those patients. So that's a little bit about predictive tests, a little bit about prognostic tests. I'm going to switch over now to the Lynch syndrome. Any questions about um, that so far? <laughs> OK, so well, let's talk about uh, the Lynch syndrome. Uh, it's a, a subject that's very dear to my heart because that's how my career started in oncology. Um, came to work in 1995 to work with Dr. Lynch. And he taught, taught me a lot about genetics, and we traveled all over the country and actually all over the world doing a lot of his uh, familial uh, genetic studies. But they kind of all started back in the late 1800s with a doctor named Dr. Morton. And he described a family that had cancer in multiple generations. And so this is the act actually the pedigree that he put together that was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 1913. And this was a family that had endometrial cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancers, and it would just seem like there was too much cancer in this family. So he went ahead and reported that. Well, Dr. Lynch then came along in the 1960s, and he got interested in cancer genetics. He initially was doing, um, I think he did a PhD in just regular genetic type studies, genetic illnesses and then got interested in malignancy. So he 
found these families, termed family M and N, in the uh, 60s and published those as cancer family syndrome. Um, he then went and looked at this family G in 1971 and published an update on that. And so this is a time when we didn't think cancer was hereditary. Okay? We thought cancer was you know, because of radiation or whatever. And the scientific um, approach at that time was that it's not a hereditary process, and therefore you're crazy going and describing all these families. But he did, and he also collected samples of blood um, from them and stored them. And then in the 80s, it became recognized, well, maybe there is something to this. So they called these syndromes Lynch syndrome 1 and 2. Syndrome 1 is the um, hereditary colon cancer with primary colon cancer tumors. Syndrome 2 is the um, uh, syndrome where there's additional cancers. And I'll go over those in a little bit, uh, besides just colon. Um, in the 90s, we realized that, well, we need to have some objective way of identifying these patients. So that was this Amsterdam criteria. And then in, in the mid, early mid-90s, finally we found the genes that uh, account for this disease. Now, the only way you could find those genes was by looking at patients that you had collected DNA on, and then you had the clinical information on. Well, who had that information? Nobody except Dr. Lynch. So Dr. Lynch had, you know, freezers in his uh, office down at Creighton full of uh, samples of DNA that once the, su the science developed, once the technology developed that we could actually look at DNA for mutations, we could go back, take these samples, look for uh, germline mutations, and then correlate them with um, the tumors that come up with the genes. So that's, that's how that was able to happen. And then in 2005, he updated this family G, G, and it turns out they had a mutation in the MSH2 gene. So this is the pedigree of them. I don't know if that doesn't show up too bad. So this family, there's seven generations here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the darkened um, areas are people who've been affected with cancer, males and females. And you can see that generation after generation, cancer is developing in these families. The more recent generations, you don't have any yet. But now we can use the gene to, to determine who's at high risk and who isn't through testing their DNA. And there's Dr. Lynch doing one of his family cancer conferences where he's educating the families. And these families can have hundreds and thousands of members in them. Um, telling them what uh, the DNA genetics is all about and how we're going to determine the risk and then either put people into early screening or not or so on. Oh, uh, who's that guy? How did that get in there? But, uh, and then this was a slide, you know, I was just a young fellow working with Dr. Lynch and I was kind of rummaging through some of his old closets and things down at the office and I came across this slide and I was like, Henry, what is that? Well, this is a trailer that he and his wife used to haul around to different grocery stores around here, and it was for cancer screening, and this was in the 1970s. So he did a mammogram, he did a rectal exam, he did like a dental exam, because he knew that families with hereditary cancer needed to be screened earlier. So uh, there wasn't any screening guidelines, there wasn't any proof that screening helped, but he knew that, you know, intuitively, this should be done. So that's what he was doing as early as the 1970s. Now, we do have a cancer prevention program here um, that was started in 1997. And I, I work on that with Kathy Christensen, um, Laura Krychek, and then our genetic counselor, Hope Chipman. And so we're happy to see your patients and help them with their genetic risk. These are the visits that we've had from 1998 to 2011. Kind of a steady increase over the years, and then the last few years it's dropped off a little bit. Um, probably because more of these tests are being done in doctors' offices, and they don't necessarily feel like they need our expertise. However, if you look at the genetic testing, 
over time, that's had a steady increase. And this is for not just colon cancer, but all cancer syndromes. So a lot of it is breast cancer. But genetic testing is becoming more acceptable. <coughs> it's uh, being covered by insurance companies now. There's not the risk of discrimination that we used to think about. So we're doing more of that to help um, identify patients' risks so that they can take um, action about early detection and other options. So I'll just kind of finish up briefly with a little bit about the Lynch syndrome. As I mentioned, um, we've identified the genetic, genetic basis for that, and these are the uh, mutations. Common ones, as I mentioned, MLH1, MSH2. Um, Lynch syndrome, like many other syndromes, is the cancers occur earlier on in the course of a person's life than ones that are not hereditary. So in this case, the cancers can occur on average at age 45 compared to age 63 in the general population. So that wouldn't make a lot of sense to start colonoscopy at age 50 if somebody is a hereditary risk. You need to start them sooner. Um, and so that's the beauty of identifying hereditary syndromes is we'll start screening earlier. Um, other cancers that can occur with this syndrome are mentioned here, the most common endometrial. So if you see patients with endometrial cancer associated with colon cancer in the family, you should think of Lynch syndrome. Um, and uh, let's see, I think I'll, that's just some of the history.